and uh, welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. I'm uh, Terry O'Connor from the University of York and I'm your chair for this evening for our event, The Red Sea Scrolls, How Ancient Papyri Reveal the Secrets of the Pyramids. Uh, before we get on to the talk, a few technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button, which, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And this is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time. And we'll then take questions after the evening's talk. Should you have technical issues such as a loss of Wi-Fi and a cat walking across your keyboard, you can rejoin the event using the original link. It'll take you straight back in. Uh, subtitles are available in this event. Turn these uh, to turn these on or off. Use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Now I'm delighted uh, to be able to, to introduce to you tonight our, our two speakers. Pierre Tele and Mark Lena. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who will share with us their absolutely uh, fascinating findings about the building of the Great Pyramid at Giza, following Pierre's discovery of the Red Sea Scrolls in 2013, one of the most remarkable, momentous uh, events in the history of Egyptology. Through Mark's research, they'll then reveal how King Khufu's men built the Great Pyramid and how the ancient Egyptians were able to build monuments of a huge scale that survive right to this day. Pierre Tele is now uh, the Chair of Egyptology at the Sorbonne and has served as President of the French Society of Egyptology from 2009 to 2021 and is also a senior member of the Institut Universitaire de, de France, Universitaire de France, I do beg your pardon, since 2001, he has directed or co-directed several uh, archaeological projects in Egypt and Sudan, in particular on the shores of the Red Sea, where the old pharaonic harbours of Ain Sukhna and Wadi El Jaf were successively identified. Uh, he still leads an annual archaeological campaign on the latter site, uh, where the most ancient papyri known to date were found between 2013 and 2018. Uh, Pierre is joined tonight by Mark, Dr. Mark Lehner the Director and President of Ancient Egyptian Research Associates. Uh, Mark has carried out archaeological research in Egypt for nearly 40 years. He has mapped the Great Sphinx and discovered a, a very major part of the lost city of the pyramids at Giza. So please join me in welcoming in exactly that order, first Pierre Tele and then Mark Lehner. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I will be a little bit far away from the pyramid for the beginning of this uh, um, season because um, I will try to do a very short presentation of the um, of the arbor of uh, Wadi El Jaf and uh, then we will jump on the papyri that's are the main uh, topic of this uh, this evening. Uh, Wadi Al Jaffa Arbor is one of the three uh, arbors on the Red Sea that have been recently uh, identified. The first one was in Mersagawasis to the southern part of Egypt, but the two later, later one, the one of Ain Sourna and Wadi Al Jaff, are on the sea, on the coast of the Red Sea shore. The place of Wadi Al Jaff uh, was uh, discovered several times. In fact, it lies right in front of the uh, desert of Sinai, and was probably used by the Egyptians to cross the sea and to get to the copper mines that were very important for them during the whole um, pharaonic period. This place has been discovered several times, but uh, was not really identified before our work that started in 2011 on the place. First of all, the uh, Egyptian explorer, George Garner Wilkinson, has found the place, caves on the mountain, about five kilometers far from the sea. And, uh, but he was not able to discover, to identify an arbor with such a location. And this place has been found another time by two French pilots of the Suez Canal uh, during the 1950s, and uh, but they failed also to identify uh, the arbor of uh, Wadi El Jarf. 
In fact, this place is very special. It's probably the first attempt uh, of the pharaonic period to create an artificial arbor on the Red Sea shore. And this arbor was not uh, occupied all the time. They, it was just put into use that where they, when they needed to organize an expedition on the sea. Uh, in fact, during the reign of Khufu, because this place has not been occupied uh, another time than the very beginning of the fourth dynasty, during the, reign, during the reigns of the two founders of this dynasty, Snefru and Khufu. At the time of, Snef, of, of Khufu, there were, the expeditions were probably departing from Giza and, uh, and the pyramid of Giza that were under building at that time. And uh, they were uh, going through the Nile to get up to the area of, of Fayum, where you have also a pyramid of Snefru lying there. And then they were crossing the desert tracks to get to the Wadi El Jaf with dismantled part of boats that were put into use on the seashore. And there you have this Wadi El Jaf site that was an intermittent arbor on the seashore, allowing them to cross the sea to get to Sinai here by boat, of course, and also to get in touch with the expeditions all the time they were uh, working in Sinai. On the Red Sea shore, on the other shore of the Red Sea, of the Suez Gulf, you have a um, kind of a fortress that was made during the reign of Khufu also, and that was meant probably to protect the workers. And from that point, they could get to the mines of copper and turquoise they were uh, working in Wadi Marara, where reliefs of Snefru and Khufu has been found. This place of Wadi El Jaf was probably the first attempt to create an arbor on the Red Sea shore. But it's not so an easy place to work because everything is very um, yeah, um, far away uh, in the distance. It's probable that they choose this place for numbers of reasons. The first one is the presence of a spring that is uh, inside the modern, the, yeah, the more modern uh, Saint Paul monastery, but that's have been used during the antiquity to fetch the water. And uh, uh, this uh, spring is able to produce about four cubic meter of water every day. That was enough for several hundred people working in this place for several months. But the place is composed of many other locations. We have camps and a jetty, kind of an artificial arbor that was settled in the sea. And we have here a kind of a L shaped jetty, which is probably the most ancient artificial arbor we know so far in the world. Here, you can see it. And uh, it can merge from the water when the low is very tight. You can see a view of it. And we also have kite view of it. You can see the L shaped jetty, which is a very huge um, building because it's about 200 meters from from west to east, and again, about 200 meters from north to south. And there, the boats were able to be protected from the wind that is blowing very strongly from the north all the time of the year. You can see that here, you have not only an arbor, but also camps that were probably used by the people that were building the boats on the seashore for the expeditions. By exploiting those camps, we have found several buildings that you can see here, but in midst of the two buildings that I showed you, you can see that we found several hundred, central, several dozens of, uh, of anchors, stone anchors, almost completely preserved. And uh, we also had the surprise to find that most of them were still inscribed with the names of the boats that were using them. We had in this place more than 100 of those anchors. anchors. It means about uh, 25 tons of anchors. And we have the names of, of four boats that were probably the last one that were used in this arbor of Wadi El Jaf. And uh, what is really interesting is that the very names of those boats are exposed 
pressing kind of uh, ideological program of the monarchy because one of the boats has a name that evokes the northern uh, kingdom of the king. The other one is uh, evocating the uh, southern realm of the king. There is also the epitheton, the lord of the two lands, which is referring the, uh, to the king as the, the, yeah, the king of the two, uh, the two territories of Egypt and the first both uh, as the names living ones, the people. So you have a reflection of the of the pharaonic word, in fact, in the name of this fleet. We excavated this place, but we also excavated another place about uh, um, two kilometers from the seashore, which is placed in the midst of the whole system of the Wadi El Jaf, which is a big stone building that will mean something from, uh, for uh, Mark Lene. I think he will speak about this kind of installation uh, after me. This is uh, probably something that is uh, meant to uh, host um, workers that were involved in those expeditions. And uh, by excavating this building, we, can, we had the surprise to found that we had several different occupations. This big building, which is very huge because it's about 60 meter long and 40 meter large. But underneath, we, have, we had the surprise to find that they had a completely different occupation, probably most ancient, and coming up to the time of the, the King Snefru, the immediate predecessor of Rufu. Uh, but this is uh, the, what we have done on the seashore. But the main place we had excavated those last 10 years was a place uh, that was meant to store the boats themselves. And this place is the one that has been firstly discovered by John Gardner Wilkinson. It's a complex of caves. Those caves were cut into the limestones of the of the mountain. You can see here a kite view of them, and those caves were used to store the boats in between two expeditions. They didn't took the care to bring back the boats to the Nile Valley, but make them wait for the next expeditions inside those caves. So they had to dismantle the boats and store them inside those caves. Those caves are really interesting for us. We have found plenty of material, interesting material uh, inside. We have 31 of them. Some of them are more than 30 meters long. They are huge, large, um, and very, um, very nicely made. But it is a place also where we have found dozens of papyri. In fact, we have about 1,000 of fragments of papyri of different size that are coming up from the entrance of all those caves. For the caves, I just uh, show you a few pictures of them. You can see that they were made in the limestone, <coughs> but also the Egyptian people for the, from the first dynasty around 2600 BC managed to close them carefully with limestone blocks that's why weighing probably more, every one of them is weighing more than one ton, in fact. And they had to close the caves very carefully to avoid them to be plundered when there was nobody on the place. And you can see the, uh, the defensive system of the closing of those caves that is obvious everywhere on the place. Here are a few views of insides of caves very uh, clearly made and of the plugs of limestones that were used to, uh, to, to block them in between two expeditions. But it's at the entrance of one of those caves, cave number one, that we have made the most impressive discovery. It was in 2013. And in this very place, we have found about 800 fragments of papyri. Most of them had been placed in between two blocks of limestones. We don't know if that's, they were only discarded or if it was a kind of a cachette, but in fact, it has been found inside this place in between those two blocks. You can see 
<coughs> fragments of those papyri at the time of the discovery here. And uh, immediately at the time of discovery, we had to unroll the papyri, to, to clean up the papyri and to place them in the frames of glass to have them preserved. I can see, show you a picture of the, of the excavation of the papyri themselves by uh, my colleague, uh, Aurore Siabati, uh, placing them in boxes to have them uh, brought to the uh, office where we were restoring them. And at the end of this campaign, we had nice uh, fragments of papyri that could be placed together like this one, which is papyrus, papyrus number B. I will speak uh, longer of him, uh, uh, of it uh, in a few minutes. That was basically what we had at the end of the 2013 uh, campaign, archaeological campaign on the Wadi El Jaf. And we have produced about 100 of those glaze, frames of glaze, of glass to, uh, to store the papyri. Basically, we have two different kinds of papyri. First of all, we have accounting documents that are uh, giving information about the way the administration was giving uh, food and tools to the workers. And we have also logbooks. Uh, that's uh, made by the workers themselves, and they are giving an account of the work that is given to them by the administration, to, uh, just to justify maybe the wage that they have all the of the long of the year. This papyrus is really important for us because it is the only one that has a precise datation. It's probably dated back to the end of Rufu's reign, the year after the 13 cancers of the cattle, the years of, uh, uh, at that time, were counted by two, and uh, it probably corresponds to year 26 or 27 of the reign of Rufu. So we have a precise datation at the end of the reign of, the, of this king, but we also have the name of the team that was operating in this uh, place. And the team has for name, the followers of Rufus Ureus is its prow. We had, we, we needed time to understand the name of this, uh, this team, but in fact, we finally understood that the team is named after a boat to which it is linked most probably. And this is probably a boat that has a royal emblem of a snake at its prow. And so we have an idea of the teams that were keeping those archives. This is basically a team of boatmen. What you can see here is that the, we, this, this name of team is not alone on the place because we also have found several hundreds of potteries that are bearing the same name, a shortened version of this name. So it's clear that it is a team that spent a long time on the place during the end of the reign of, uh, of Rufu. I just show you very quickly a few of the documents that you have found. Some of them are really impressive because they are very well uh, written. For example, this one is coming from the granary. It's uh, a um, papyrus that is giving the account of tools and food given to the, to the worker. Uh, this other one is a small build that's probably is giving uh, food and tools to the worker that's where involved in the uh, building the boats on the coast, on the place I showed you uh, in a, a few minutes ago. And it's named several tools of carpenters like uh, Menbet, Axes, Annette, and Mener, for example, here. And uh, we even have found sometimes very strange documents like this one. This papyrus is complete, and it is probably the most ancient ID card of the world because it's just a way to identify an official that was probably sent to this place of Wadi El Jaf at the time it was put into work. And the, the ID card is to the name of a, a guy whose name is uh, uh, Nefer Iru, and he is uh, the controller of the dwarves of the of the magazine of the king. So it's a very strange, uh, <coughs> a very strange title that we have here. 
But the most interesting for, uh, for us was the discovery of those logbooks that are probably dating from the very last part of the reign of, uh, of Hufu. We have most probably about 10 of them. Some of them are um, to the name of uh, small officials, whose, so small official whose name is Inspector Merer, C.H. Merer. But we have also logbooks that are made by scribe Dedi. So we have two officials making them. And the system is that the, you have here at the top of the, of the papyrus, the datation of the months. Here you have the first months of the inundation. On the second line, you have all the day of the months that are recorded here uh, from one to 30. And for each day, you have two columns of text that are giving the daily reports of what this team has done this very day. And uh, what is really uh, fascinating, and we in fact were aware of this at the time, even of the, at the time of the discovery is that most of the logboats that we have are speaking of the building of the pyramid of Khufu and the way so those teams of sailors could be involved in managing the place of Giza as well as the place of Wadi El Jaf. This is the final reconstitution of the journal of Merer, Papyrus B. And this uh, paper papyrus is giving us account of the delivery of limestone blocks that are coming from the quarries of Tura on the eastern side of the Nile, and that have been brought during the time of the inundation to Giza area and to the complex of Achet Hufu, Hufu's horizon, which is the name of the pyramid complex of the King Hufu. Uh, so we have the names of the artificial basins that are at the foot of the Giza plateau, and we have dozens of times the name Roche Rufu, which means the entrance to Rufu's lake. And I think that Mark Lenner will speak much better than me than to uh, of those uh, uh, artificial lakes that were made to allow the boat to bring the material for the building of the pyramid of, of Rufu. So we have this information of on the papyri that is giving us a precise uh, information about the landscape of Giza, the water basins and the pyramid itself, the town of the workers that we could have at this place. And we have a very repetitive text that is indicating each day uh, the mission that is given to the team, the way they are bringing the limestone blocks by boat from the quarries of Stura to the place of Giza. And it takes about two days to go to Giza with, loaded with stones and one day to get back to the Tura area with an empty boat. So we have this information, which is really interesting because of course it's the first uh, um, indication that we have about the uh, building of the, of the pyramid of Khufu by a people, a person, an official that was able to see everything that was happening on this place. And of course he has probably all the answers to the questions that we are, um, we have about the building of the pyramid, but unfortunately for us is most concentrated on in his own tasks. And it doesn't give another information than uh, the way he is delivering stones to the building projects of the king. Sometimes you have interesting information of, for example, here at the beginning of the months, they are sending a boat to Heliopolis to get the bread for the the bread for the months for the team of the uh, of the workers. So it means that uh, uh, they are departing from Tura to go to Heliopolis. It takes about uh, uh, three days, four days to get there. They have a massive uh, delivery of basic breads. And I was able to calculate that it is probably the monthly ration that corresponds to a team of about 40 men for one full month. 
And what is also interesting here is that it fits very well for the general reconstruction of the work in Giza that has been made by Mark Lehner, because he can uh, determine that uh, the galleries he has found in Giza were each uh, able to host about a team of 40 men that would correspond pretty well with, to a team like the team of Merer, uh, that is uh, uh, the author of the logs books uh, that we have found. Sometimes we have also more um, exceptional events. Uh, and in this case, we have the apparition of a very, very important uh, official that is mentioned by the uh, papyri. Uh, this guy is the, uh, the noble Ha'ef. He appears here. And uh, this guy is clearly a very important uh, person because he's the half brother of uh, Rufu. Is probably at that time the vizier and director of all the building projects of the king. And so it's very logical that the team of those boatmen that are in charge of bringing the building material to the pyramid area uh, are under the direction of this, uh, this guy. We have those big logbooks. But we also have hundreds of small fragments that are not so exciting at first glance. This is the fragments of the, what we have called Papyrus D, small fragments, dozens of small fragments. But sometimes we are lucky enough to be able to place them on the frame. And even if we have a very, very short part of the original document, I could calculate that probably we have only 15% of the entire papyrus that uh, was we preserved at the time of the discovery of this archive, but it still gives very in precious information about Giza at the time of Rufu. And we can have a nice information about what the boatman team is doing. She is involved in the, uh, the guard of the portal, probably of the valet temple of the king which is in connection with the river Nile and the basins at the foot of the, of the Giza plateau. They are linked to a place whose name is Anhu Rufu, May Live Rufu. And she's in charge of several um, activities like bringing food and flour, transporting troops, bringing natron, and also to do the ritual for the king. So there are very polyvalent teams that are used by the king. And they are not slaves, but a very skilled teams that are probably most appreciated by the, by the king and the administration. Also, we have an idea of what is the landscape of uh, Giza at that time, because uh, we have the name of Anhu Rufu, which is probably the name of the valley temple of the king and maybe of uh, neighboring uh, settlements of workers. But we have also the indication of a portal, the entrance of the complex. We have the mention of the granary from where we can take uh, food and uh, material. We have several mention of the residence, which is probably meaning that the royal palace is nearby the pyramid itself in this area. And we even have one mention of the archives. The papyrus are, are nice enough to give us the information of the place where they should have been kept if they had not been left in the place, in the remote place uh, of Wadi El Jaf. So from those papyri, it's possible to have an idea of the, uh, the place of Giza at the time of the building of the pyramid of Rufu. And we also have plenty of information about the teams that were in charge of building this pyramid, bringing the material, and also probably making the cult to the king. I, I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Pierre. That's uh, delightful and just fascinating. Uh, we move on, I think, to your, your co-author, Mark, Mark Lena, if you're in a position to pick up at this point. Hello, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Pierre for that excellent presentation and, um, and also say that it's a real honor for me to be joining Pierre in any sense um, in uh, writing that book together and just comparing our research and 
um, what Pierre has been talking about has been hugely insightful for me. Um, I start with this slide uh, under our topic. It shows the pyramids uh, engulfed in fog, which they really are quite often in January. And uh, because for me, it's symbolic of the fog that has so long surrounded the pyramids. I think for 200 years, they were really in a fog uh, in terms of our understanding of them. 200 years ago, we started to be enlightened with the growth of Egyptology. And I think there's been so much more information in the last 20 years. And then because of everything Pierre was talking about, especially in the last 10 years, where we actually have somebody's diary who was working on the Great Pyramid, it's uh, hard to ask for more, but we certainly would uh, welcome more <laughs> in the way of information and discoveries, uh, papyri or whatever. The port of Khufu at Mauri Darf is itself truly fascinating, to say nothing of the papyri. So I would like to tell you a little bit about our research at Giza, which has been going on for about 30 years. I would like to get in um, a special thanks to the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities for all the research and opportunities that we have. Um, yeah, let me try to go through this quickly so that I can reconnect with everything Pierre was talking about. So more than 30 years ago, um, I started an interdisciplinary excavation project at the Giza Pyramids, and, and our whole concern was settlements. Um, it was after going to graduate school at Yale and learning about the world's first cities, uh, which appeared in the Near East about... Um, about this magic half millennium from 3000 BC to about 20, 2500 BC. <clears throat> Unless of course, all that changes with Graeber and Vengro, but um, maybe not. If, um, if cities were appearing in the Indus Valley, in North Syria, in Elam, were, were, there, were there cities in, in Egypt? And this was a question that I was asking. Colleagues were saying that they may have gathered people together in numbers of 20 or 30,000 people. That, in fact, was equal to the numbers of the world's first cities, or at least the Near East's first cities, according to various researchers, places like Ur and Uruk and Shurupak, 20 to 30,000 people. So I wondered, after studying the monuments themselves, the Sphinx and then the Great Pyramid for a good number of years, uh, well, where is this city? And <clears throat> I'm sure there are sophisticated theoretical ways to put this, but simply we were asking, where are all the people? Like all the people we see on a festival day when Cairo comes out to Giza as kind of Egypt's national park. Where were all the people then? Um, where's their settlement? What would it tell us about their lives? How are they organized? What would the footprint of that settlement tell us? Um, about how they organized their forces for building the Great Pyramid. And so, in fact, we were asking, how did the pyramids build Egypt? And I realized that to understand the pyramids, in a certain sense, we must look away from them and uh, <clears throat> look for evidence of the people, the builders. So how do you find a lost city? Where should we look for their homes, their workshops, their cattle corrals, bakeries, and harbors? Well, I, we look to the landscape. And Possibly in classic archaeological method, we started mapping the Giza Plateau and studying it from both the topographical aspect and also the geology, what you could call geoarchaeology, locating the quarries. Um, you'll see um, <clears throat> a label there with an arrow pointing to the Haito Garab, which is Wall of the Crow, and that, in fact, is the name of our site. Um, the, the landscape pretty much boxed in the possibilities of where to look for a lost city, because the Pyramid Plateau proper is the Mokatum Formation, as it's called. It's a Middle Eocene for you geologists, about 50 million years ago. It slopes down to the southeast at about six degrees into a wadi, a valley. And then there's a younger geological formation called the Mahdi Formation to the south. Anybody who wants to get anything up into the plateau, like Merer, who is delivering stone, as Pierre has just shown us, you have to come in at the low southeast base of the Giza Plateau, north of the Wall of the Crow, or Haito Garab, the name of our site, which is just behind the Wall of the Crow. Um, <clears throat> to answer our questions, we developed a model of how the pyramid builders used and organized the hard rock landscape. We predicted settlements south of the quarries and access routes through the wadi. If that's how they got things in, we should look for a harbor out there at the foot of the Mokatham Formation. And this is all before we heard any, we even knew about the site of Wadi El Jarf. 
This was back in 1985. In 1988, <clears throat> we started excavation. And as a, after 34 years of excavation, um, we have uncovered about seven to 10 hectares of a footprint of the state where the state, that is to say the royal house of the fourth dynasty that Pierre was talking about, stepped down and, and built the pyramids, the three Giza pyramids and walked on. Um, so 34 years of uh, research must be summarized, I think in one slide. This is an overall footprint, Pierre already showed it to you. In 2004, we mapped the gallery complex, and this is something we want to focus on, these galleries, because they look like a building that Pierre has shown us from Wadi al-Jarf. Bakeries filled the area between the gallery complex and an enclosure wall. Um, we also found a more normal looking settlement, an Eastern town of small houses and courtyards that flanked the gallery complex on the east. We also found an even bigger sprawl of settlement with bigger houses. You'll have to take my word for it. It looks like just a morass of a labyrinth there. But within that morass of walls, we found larger houses that we could call elite. We think where administrators lived. <clears throat> but then we also found <laughs> half buried under uh, the Abu Hol Sports Club in soccer field. Abu Hol means Sphinx in Arabic the Royal Administrative Building with large grain storage silos. It lay to the Southeast, mostly buried under a soccer field. Well, in those galleries, if you can see in the little thumbnail there, we found tiny little houses in the back. They look like the room structure of houses that we knew from other sites in ancient Egypt, in the Old Kingdom. We save every scrap of material culture, animal bone, we do flotation, ancient plant remains, and we were just finding abundant evidence of mass consumption of meat. I know Terry might be interested in that. Um, a lot of cattle bone, sheep, and goats. And we were finding dozens of bakeries. Where were all the consumers? We only had about, you know, one to two dozen houses at the backs of these galleries within the gallery complex itself. So, um, <clears throat> Who were the consumers? What were these galleries? We came up with the barracks hypothesis, and it remains a hypothesis. Um, and, but we're more certain of its probability after everything that Pierre has just talked about. So we had the idea that people of the provinces pulsed through the complex of galleries during periods of obligatory labor. We know that labor was obligatory through much of ancient Egypt. Um, <clears throat> We experimental archaeology, I guess you could call it. We found that 40 people could lay out comfortably within the gallery, 20 to a side. 20, we already knew from what Egyptologists had discovered from papyri later than the papyri that Pierre talked about, the Abu Sir papyri of the next dynasty. We knew that a phyle, a group of people, mostly men probably at that time and in that context, numbered about 40 people. So we started to wonder whether each gallery was appropriate to a phyle, what the ancient Egyptians called a za. Um, <clears throat> we were finding the architectural footprint of labor organization. And here's this word, za. The word za is written in hieroglyphic with a cattle hobble, a rope tied in 10 loops that you tie around the legs of young animals so that they all move together. Um, we, we knew that ZA was a unit of um, labor organization, that for building projects and royal works, they would organize men, probably men and young men, into these ZA. Um, 2,000 years later, the Greeks translated ZA with their word phyle, which means technically, literally tribe. And so that's the word that Egyptologists use. And they were probably a following of young recruits, such as they idealize on the walls of their temples. So there were five named phyles, Zau, at a W or an U at the end, and it's plural. And they all had the same standard names in the Old Kingdom. And we find these names, four of them, in the Wadi al-Jarf papyri. They have correspondences to parts of boats. There's the great, the port, the green, and the little. There's kind of a morphemic progression, a progression of meaning there from great, well, port is a little bit of a wrinkle, but then green or fresh, little. 
We don't find the last phyle, and Pierre and I have talked about this a number of times, so far in the fourth dynasty, the time of the Giza pyramids. Now, one of the most complete formulations, though, of the labor organization occurs on the walls of the third pyramid temple, where you have these gangs, which are upper. Um, you see the gang there, the gang name, hieroglyph upper. And uh, <clears throat> this is a gang name that's long been translated, the Drunkards of Menkare Gang. This gets a bit technical, but Pierre is probably right that instead of drunkards, it should be the ones known of Menkare Gang. Uh, but drunkards is more fun. And then, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you have the green or the fresh phyle. And see, there's a hieratic version of the hieroglyph for phyle. And then you have an area designation, the designation of you know Yorkshire or North Carolina. In this case, it's the Upper Egyptian Nome 17. So that seems to be a complete formulation of the kind of labor organization that Pierre was also showing at Wadi Darf. Maybe in a little bit more rudimentary, less formalized form. That's a topic for discussion. Anyway, I think the most important thing of what we have found in these galleries, in this gallery complex, is that this was a precociously early modern institutional building for pulsing people, like our hospital, schools, prisons, hotels, or barracks. I don't know if you've read what Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, writes about, but I think he would have been interested in this. And it's a very early incipient form of such a building for building something like the Great Pyramid. Now, our analysis of the material culture in the lab gives interesting results. The discovery continues in the lab. Reiner Garish, who analyzes our charcoal, found, started finding um, olive wood. Most of the wood is acacia. They were burning their local wood cover. It was pyrotechnically very expensive to build the Great Pyramid. But um, he was finding olive charcoal, which is interesting, wood charcoal, and uh, of little twigs, maybe packing material. And then Claire Mallison was actually finding, found an olive pit. It could be an Egyptian plum, we're not sure. But we were also finding other interesting evidence of imports, like combware for resin, wine, or olive oil. These combware jars, combware because they take some kind of a comb and, and rake the jar to give it some kind of a texture, are typical of the EB3 period, the early Bronze III period in the Levant. And they are found in elite tombs at Giza. And they are thought to have been the commercial maritime container of their time, not unlike the later Roman amphora. So we were finding fragments. And when we plotted the combware and the olive wood, they were in the gallery complex. Then I plotted all of Reiner Garish's imported wood, charcoal that he was finding, and we were finding cedar, pine, oak, and cypress in the gallery complex, as well as elsewhere, but especially in the gallery complex. So the question was, why are these workers, if this is just a worker's town, what are they doing with these elite luxury products? So the, the, the insight was that <clears throat> they were receiving these products from these foreign expeditions especially to Byblos. And when we could uh, locate the, the origins of the combware, it tends to come from the area north of Beirut or around Byblos. So we started to think of our site as the recipient, not just of workers gathered from all over Egypt and home-based fellowships, but also goods brought from all over, including Sinai via places like Wadi El Jarf. But we didn't know about Wadi El Jarf at the time. We thought the Haito Garab site must have flanked a massive harbor infrastructure with scenes like Sahure's fleet. Sahure is a king about 25 years later after the Giza pyramids, and he shows an expedition returning on the walls of his causeway. And um, <clears throat> it was interesting that already Egyptologists before Wadi El Jarf and its discoveries were seeing that crews and gangs on boats and ships had names very similar, if not the same, to the graffiti that workers left on stone blocks. So we began to think of a lost port city of the pyramids, not just a common workers town. And all of this was happening before Wadi El Jarf. Well, I think Pierre was working at Wadi El Jarf, but we weren't hearing about it until about 2012. We were asking, is this an exceptional site, an exceptional time? And then we started hearing about these parallels at a port of Khufu on the Red Sea. And as Pierre already showed, you have galleries or 
what might be barracks there, but of a much more kind of rustic sort because it's at Giza, of course, it's the home base and it's more permanent than the episodic expeditions that came and went from places like Wadi al Jarf. So in 2012, word of a discovery on the Red Sea and Pierre came to visit us at Giza. And um, <clears throat> we learned about the Journal of Mare, which Pierre has just told us about. And we started to see certain matches with the Hato Garab galleries in the barracks, hypothesis. For example, we already saw one where 40 people, we had determined were probably the number of people in one of the galleries. Pierre has told you that 40 people, 40 men, are about the size of Mare's Za. And note that, you know, in so the papyri, Mare quite often says, Inspector Mare, which I'm blowing up here, together with his Za, which Pierre determined was about 40 men. Um, and indeed, Mare's Philae may have hailed from Lower Egypt, the Delta, Nome too, because the scribe added the emblem for this gnome in a horizontal margin below the daily entries in Papyrus A. So that was one interesting set of correspondences that you have home based fellowships. There were other correspondences, and that relates to the waterscape and landscape at Giza. For example, the Wadi al Jarf papyri mentioned Mare and his Za joining other Zau working at the dike of Khufu with the nobleman Ankhof that Pierre has shown us. Well, meanwhile, I was working on reconstructing the water transport infrastructure of the fourth dynasty that allowed the pyramids to be built, that allowed stone blocks to be delivered. I was collecting together evidence that had been gathered in the last 30 years that a lot of people didn't really know about. For example, 500 meters east of the Khufu Valley Temple, a huge wall was discovered of basalt on a limestone foundation, the same materials that Khufu's Valley Temple was made out of, which we know from trenches that crossed the Valley Temple during a sewage, uh, the implementation of a sewage project. Is this the dike of Khufu that is mentioned in the Wadi al Jarf papyri, where Merer was working with Ankhof? Possibly. But meanwhile, with independently of Pierre translating the papyri, I was trying to translate the landscape. And what I showed you in the, in the uh, what we call the Zaglu Street Wall is just one example of evidence we used to reconstruct the pyramid builders floodplain and waterways. What you're looking at is a, is a contoured bathymetric model. In other words, I'm actually using the contours that I think obtained at that time a floodplain that was about four and a half to five meters lower than the floodplain of today, which is hosting basically an expansion of downtown Cairo. How do we know those contours? How do we know those spot heights? Because the, the ancient monuments like the Zaglu Street Wall, the remains of the Khufu Valley Temple, which have been found, give us benchmarks and boundaries. So to deliver stone up to the Great Pyramid before Khafre carved the Sphinx, Mayor had to come in at that low area at the end of a central canal basin. Um, the bathymetric model allowed us to ask, how did the builders control the flood? Do you know that in the deep channel, the main Nile channel, the flood rose seven meters, 21 feet. That's a huge force. Now the channel is deep, it's like a big moat. It's only a meter and a half over the floodplain, but still that's a tremendous hydraulic lift. Did they use that? There's evidence both from the papyri and from the monuments, the benchmarks and boundaries that we know from the fourth dynasty at Giza that they did. And uh, the details of it are too, too much to go into in the next few minutes because we have to sum up here. But Pierre and I started exchanging notes and there was this whole operation that Mayor and his men did where they were dealing with huge, uh, probably wooden piles. Uh, and, and either removing them or installing them to build up a head of water at the, um, <clears throat> the Sheikh Khufu, the Lake of Khufu that Pierre mentioned. Um, and Pierre had, um, had team members um, compose a kind of Google Earth view of what the land and waterscape should look like, where these basins that Mirror is mentioning should be. And they fit very nicely the reconstruction that, that um, we were coming up with from the benchmarks and boundaries and the reconstructions at Giza. So that was a happy confluence 
Um, now, I just want to finish very quickly with Papyrus D, which is not of Merer, but Merer's boss, Dedi, as Pierre has shown us. Papyrus D is another logbook of Dedi, perhaps the one who is in charge of the four phylies who comprised the gang. And as Pierre has shown us, it speaks of a palace of Khufu in the city Hank Khufu lives. Now, Pierre also said that the papyri Papyrus D mentions a granary. And in fact, to return to that royal administrative building, it has a huge sunken court with big round silos. And this is in 2002 that we are excavating this storehouse of Pharaoh. Now, Pierre might disagree because there's evidence to situate the granary mentioned in the papyri over near the Valley Temple of Khufu. But could this be that granary? Because we know there's an older phase. Everything we have found dates to the reign of Khafre and Menkare, not Khufu. But <clears throat> at one point, they recommissioned the whole Hetogarab site. They completely restructured it. And we think they took the material up over the Gebel al Ghibli, which means Southern Mount, escarpment, and dumped it at that place called KRO after Carl Cromer, who excavated a huge dump of municipal, of, of settlement debris when they did this reconstruction. He had ceilings of Khufu and Khafre, but none of Menkare. We have thousands of ceilings that we have captured over 34 years. We have ceilings of of Khafre and Menkare, but none of Khufu. However, <clears throat> we went back to Cromer in 2018, and from the Cromer dump, like Cromer, we found evidence of a very chic, very upscale, high status buildings, painted plaster, high ranking ceilings, um, and more than I can go into. Among the ceilings we found is the one here, which actually the hieroglyphs read Setebza, one of the terms for palace perhaps more the military part. You may recall, you may have caught in Pierre's talk, that at one point in, point in Papyrus D, they are transporting the Setebza, or Setebzau. Merer and his men call themselves the Setebza in certain instances. Here, they join with those in the red rectangle who are upon the registry of the Setebzau. And here we're finding a ceiling, we think, with some inference from Cromer's dump, which is from the early phase of our site. So one of the things that I think I would like to talk to Pierre about more is whether, in fact, everything that we're finding at Heto Garab once existed to the north at Ankhu Khufu, near the Valley Temple, or are we dealing with one vast royal pyramid building palace city? where we have the Setebza and maybe that granary. And the palace, the residential palace that's mentioned in the Wadi al Darf Papyrus D is to the north. So those are questions. Um, Cromer thought that we had a, a royal administrative building, which is what we've called this huge enclosure. Only this year did we remove that soccer field and start to excavate that royal building. But you're going to have to stay tuned. That building, is as big as the big, one of the biggest palaces we know from ancient Egypt, the Amenhotep III Palace at Malkata in Luxor. And on the left, I've put in the White House because it's very topical. Um, it's a very big building. It's not a palace where the king lived by any means, but I think it's part of a palace complex and it could be what we'd call the Setebza. Well, how will the Hate Til Garab site further relate to Wadi El Jarf? We continue in September 2023, like in about eight months, and we will continue to stay in touch with Pierre. We hope our work helps lift that fog that has too long surrounded the pyramids and sheds new light on the subject. So stay tuned. Thanks to the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, and thanks to many ERA supporters. Thank you. That's uh, really quite, quite remarkable. And, uh... I wish we had twice as long as <laughs> I'm sure Sorry about that. we could have filled it easily. We've got a, I've got a number of questions stacked up. There really isn't time to, to go through all of them, but I'd like to just pick up a, a, a couple off here fairly quickly, if I could. Um, in particular, uh, somebody posting us, anonymous attendee asks whether the caves at the Wadi were man-made or natural, or are they natural caves that have been enlarged uh, to make them suitable as, <coughs> excuse me, suitable as stores? 
Yeah, can you come in on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all the caves that we have in Wadi Al Jaf are main man, uh, man, uh, man made. Yeah. Oh, we okay. have we have we have thirty one of them. It's a very huge complex. All the other arbors that we have have uh, the, the two other arbors on the Red Sea have only ten caves. Here we have thirty one, and I think it's a huge uh, enterprise on, uh, at the at the scale of the pyramids. They are very well well made. One major concern from them was to avoid uh, water entering the caves to spoil the boats and the wood that would have been stored inside but everything is artificial the problem is that it's uh, it's about five kilometers from the sea and it's probably one of the reasons why they had to to abandon the place to leave the place after the reign of Khufu because they they realized that it was not so easy to manage with the storerooms that are so far from the from the seashore oh yeah okay um, Casey Errington asks uh, an interesting question. I think while working on this book together, is there anything you disagreed on in interpretation, especially with uh, how many older interpretations you're correcting or reinterpreting? Uh, the interesting thing now would be if one of you says yes and the other says no. <laughs> Pierre, which do you want to say yes or no? <laughs> no, we are, we are not real disagreement because, in fact, I was helped in my deciphering of, of, the, of the papyri by all the work that has been previously done by Mark Liner. Uh, in fact, if he has not been there about 30 years working in, in Giza, we would know quite nothing about the place. And it was really uh, yeah, nice to, to be able to, to, to recognize the place that has been pre pre previously seen and, and, and identified by by Mark Lehner uh, in the papyri. That was really nice. I, the problem is that oh in the papyri, the only point is that it uh, looks like in the papyri that we have something that could be uh, closer to the Valet Temple of Rufu, so a little bit further from the Eit El Gourob uh, area. But of course, we know nothing of what, was, what is in between the Eit El Gourob uh, area and the Valet Temple of Rufu. So it's still possible that we have, as Mark has said, uh, a very huge complex that would have occupied all the feet, foot of the plateau, uh, Giza, the Giza plateau. Mm. Yeah, for yeah. me, um... I, the, we teach um, the kind of archaeology we practice in a field school for young Egyptian archaeologists, and we have done so for almost two decades. And the motto of our field school is we are not looking for things, we are looking for information. And uh, I'm very um, committed to the idea that all we have are hypotheses with different degrees of probability. And what I've really enjoyed with Pierre is a total openness in terms of considering different possibilities as to how all this relates together. I would like to say that I do think it's a reach that our granary and the royal building that we have is the granary in Papyrus D. I do think that's a reach. I think it's more probable because I've read Pierre's, you know, he's, Pierre has just published uh, Papyrus D. And I, I, given the confluence of evidence, it looks like it's all happening there on the waterfront mm -hmm. by the Valley Temple. I think that's the more probable. I am intrigued by this ceiling we found that mentions the Setebza, and that Setebza, of course, was a big, it's a very general deep topic, hotly debated between two or three people. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I would like to say, I concede that it's more probable at this point um, that the granary that Pierre has in the papyri are near the Valley Temple, which would make sense in terms of temple layouts and their economic functions and so on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. One, one more. We really are um, actually overrunning the clock. We'll squeeze one more in. Uh, <clears throat> Mary Mislenik asks, uh, was uh, Wadi Al Jaf continuously inhabited? Or does it seem to be inhabited? Do you think it was inhabited only seasonally? Um, and perhaps for how many years, for how long was it inhabited? Yeah, uh, in fact, it's one of the things that we want to know. Uh, this place has been occupied very shortly. Uh, it seems to begin with the reign of Snefru, but maybe not the, from the beginning of the reign of Snefru. And uh, uh, we have the um, evidence of the translation from this place of Wadi El Jaf to the place of Ainsuna during the reign of Hafre, which who is the fourth king of the of the fourth dynasty. Wow. 
so the full uh, the full time of the place of Wadi El Jaf is only maybe less than 50 years and during that lapse of time uh, we can imagine that they had they have made about three major expeditions in this place. Uh, we have about three phases of occupations. Uh, it, it means that they could they could stay a long time, more than one year on the place, even if the, in the, if the harbor is occupied seasonally, because it's not possible to sail the Red Sea during uh, winter, but they could stay several uh, uh, years, uh, managing the boats and going regularly to Sinai during summer. And when they have got enough copper for their work, they just left the place, close the caves and leave the boats waiting for another expeditions. So basically we have evidence for three major operations, but of course we have not the idea of the micro uh, history that we could have in the place because uh, it's a very, very short span of time. Yeah, thank you Pierre. That's Thank you. That's excellent. And I'm, I'm so sorry to those of you, others of you that have put questions up because we are we are absolutely oh, up against the time. And all I can do, I'm afraid, is apologise to you all. And on behalf of all of us, give many thanks to Pierre and Mark for such a fascinating, detailed presentation, so much new light and, and detail on uh, Egypt's old kingdom. Uh, on the one hand, we've learned a lot of new things about possibly the most famous archaeological monuments in the world. And on the other, we've got this lovely glimpse into the working life of busy men thousands of years ago. It's all about their daily business and logging it all. Um, I will just very quickly say, if you would like to purchase a copy of Mark and Pierre's book, The Red Sea Scrolls, How Ancient Papyri Reveals Secrets of the Pyramids, and it's, it's lovely. It's an absolutely superb book. Uh, it's available from our partner booksellers, Fox Lane Books, and there's uh, more information on the festival website uh, or direct from uh, books. Fox Lane Books website. Um, that really is all we have time for this evening. Uh, again, my apologies, we've had to cut things really quite tight, but that's uh, c'est la vie, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Terry. We'll, thank you. Uh, keep up with other festival events as well. And thank you once again to Pierre and Mark for a, a really engaging and fascinating evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.